This is a clip from the Chris Break Show podcast. Jay Fo was a crazy bastard. I'd actually met him before, uh, which doesn't even matter. It's neither, neither here nor there, but I'd run into that guy before through other people. Like, that guy just made it around, you know? Mm. And sometimes you'd be walking up to your apartment, and he'd just come up to you, and out of nowhere, he'd have an entire box of, like, DVDs and mm-hmm. Xbox games and a system, you know? And like, hey, you want to buy this? You want to buy this? And the whole time he's looking around because he clearly probably just broke into somebody's apartment in the <laughs> complex and stole it. Whoa. Yeah, so needless to say, I'd never let those people know which uh, which apartment I lived yeah, in. Yeah, I remember that. You know, they were my <laughs> friends, I guess, but I never let them know. And I also... Invented a roommate. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> like you lived up there for a little bit, and Spitfire Sarah lived up there with me for a little bit. Right. And what I would do is, you know, they'd seen Sarah around. I know Jay Fo. Oh, Jay Fo coined a uh, a beautiful line. What did he call her? I think he called her Baby Girl. Yeah, yeah, Baby Girl. Yeah. So that was her name for a while, Baby Girl. But this Jay Fo guy, or Sarah, man, I would, anytime I was hanging out at the gazebo, and they'd ask about her. She had moved out months before and i'd say oh she's at work or she's doing this or she's doing that <laughs> just because i wanted them to think that the the potential that she and i also said she didn't have a car uh, nice because i wanted <laughs> and I, she's, she's agoraphobic <coughs> she never leaves the house yes i wanted the, <laughs> them to just understand the potential there could be someone in my apartment <laughs> at, at all, all times, times <laughs> even if they didn't know where my apartment was right <laughs> but sarah did say when she was there that when I was at school, some guy who looked like one of the pack that we ran with Uh-oh. came knocking on the door. Wow. Yeah, he came knocking on the door a couple times, you know. Who knows what he was doing? He might have just been checking, casing the place to see if anybody was there. Mm. Whether he knew it was my place or not, he was knocking on the door and she was looking through the people with a sword in her hand. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what scaredy girls do. They carry swords and... Uh, They'll, they'll F you up. On well, accident. On accident. We have a guest today, John. Yes, we do. Daniel Skaggs, director of the film Freeload. Yeah, which is uh, it's all about train, train jumpers. Are we calling him now? Oh, we should be. Do you want to tell him a little bit about what the film is like or play this clip, or do you want me to I call do. him? Uh, I want to do all those. Okay. But first, I want to tell you that we're trying something new here at the Chris Break Show. Do you need web hosting? Why don't you try using HostGator.com and receive 20% off using the coupon referral code CHRISBREAK. The coupon referral code CHRISBREAK. C-H-R-I-S-B-R-A-K-E. 20% off. And that's pretty good because it's only three ninety six dollars a month anyway. You get unlimited bandwidth, unlimited disk space, and a 45-day money-back guarantee. So you can either go to HostGator.com and type in the referral coupon code Chris Break, or you can go to chrisbreakshow.com and click to support the show, and you will see a banner for that, as well as our Amazon banner, which will help us out if you click that and shop through that. Some PayPal, all sorts of stuff, because we need to keep the show going, and we appreciate every help, all the little help we can get. And back to Daniel Skaggs. That was pretty good. I did that all right, right? Yeah, that sounded good. That was our first attempt. It sounded good, man. I would go buy that. I do own it, but you know You do, I, yeah, you <laughs> use it. That's the only reason why we're using it, because we don't wanna we don't wanna what do you call it? Promote anything that we can't uh verify damn. or back See, up. I lost it because I don't have this part written down. <laughs> <laughs> somebody somebody else said they don't promote anything that they wouldn't uh recommend to their mother. So that's okay. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Well, you in a chat room there? No. Oh, I thought earlier, you were... <laughs> Someone said that, you know, to off air sometime, you know. Oh, that's another thing. We do have a chat room on RadioFubar.com, which we are live on. This is our little ad section of the yeah, show. Yeah, you got to promote the show. We've learned that, you know, you got to promote the show. We don't do ads for other stuff, so we do ads for ourselves. And we've got some friends. I'm eating a banana. <laughs> <laughs> but we've got some friends, like the public blogger, our good friend Kendall F. Person. we got uh, Dale J. Gordon. These are just people that we like. Uh, Dora R. Yeah, R. I like her. Uh, that was that was some interesting feedback we received from our fan Dora, who actually lives in the Philippines, and it was sad to hear because it kind of, you could tell that it kind of broke her heart. Mm-hmm. It made me feel bad a little bit, but you know, but I I don't think she would want me to feel bad because the truth is the truth, you know. We had Warren Rodwell on who was captured in the Philippines for yeah. over a year. Yeah, she responded. To that. that was we, very cool. We had hear. an Australian on the show and. 
he uh, he went to the Philippines. You know, he lived there, tried to start a new life there. You know, at a house. You know, you know, and he seemed like a decent dude. And then all of a sudden, he got kidnapped and held hostage in the Philippines Man. by some terrorist group that lives there. And I guess the hostage taking kidnapping thing is a whole industry there. Yeah, it's, it's very common. The United States, if you go to their safety, you know, website or whatever, it tells you not to travel to this country because the risk factor is very high. And I was telling Warren Rodwell that, like, why would you ever go there? Why would you ever do this? And it's 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 her hometown, you know. Yeah. Like that's yeah, I can't imagine hearing somebody. Well, that shit, where you live in America? I hear people talk yeah. bad about America all the time. Yeah. But I think the people in America, I don't, do they talk bad about the government or the people? Probably a combination of both. But they don't talk about terrorist groups that'll kidnap you. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Dora said she was familiar with that group. She's like, I know all about those guys. You hear about them all the time. But She called them a bunch of idiots. Yeah, a bunch of idiots. <laughs> Which it sounds true. A bunch of bumbling uh, Home Alone types. But I like her. I, she had a very positive response, you know, because who knows what's going on over there. I'm sure she's not in fear every moment of her life when she's over there. Right. It didn't sound like Warren Rodwell was either. Yeah, no, he sounded actually like he was not minded too bad, but he's a tough guy. Yeah, he's crazy. He's he's that guy's interesting. We're gonna have him back on. We like him. Yeah, we're also gonna have back on uh, next week, uh, Bill Manspeaker again from Green Jello. So that should be fun. But right now we have Daniel Skex. You know what? You know what I haven't? You know what I haven't told you in a while? What? And I know you probably forgot it. I don't know why, but every Saturday night is Punk Rock Night at the Melody Inn. I just. Throwing that, that's another friend of the show. Yeah. These are people we like. If you're ever in Indianapolis, go to the Melody Inn. There's usually always something good going on there is good people. Don't be afraid of the neighborhood. Nobody ever gets hurt over there. Everything's perfectly fine. Okay? Just like Dory would say about the Philippines. Everything's okay over there. There's never had any problems. From what I've told. Not on not on punk rock night. Okay. Daniel Skaggs. Yeah, freeload that the guy rode around on trains for a year and a half and documented it. A bunch, a bunch of modern day hobos that he stayed with on the trains. You really want to play that clip, don't you? Yeah, yeah. That's what you're trying to lead into, I can tell. Yeah, I'm trying to set up the clip. All right, John's going to play a clip. Uh, Daniel Skaggs directed this documentary. This is a guy named Pony Boy. And Dr. Pong Fong introduced me. Is that, that's Pony Boy, right? Yeah. Dr. Pong Fong introduced me to this documentary uh, because he, I guess, Daniel Skaggs was traveling around town. Or around the the United States with this documentary and showing it to people and Pong Fong bought it and showed it to me and the funniest line in there <laughs> was this guy has <laughs> Pony Boy has tattoos all over his in face right all over his face and he's pointing him out to the camera and he points at this one and it just looks like a blob <laughs> it doesn't or lines it doesn't have it doesn't represent anything to me right and he points to it and he goes. Well, this one's Scott squatters' rights, obviously. obviously. <laughs> this one's squatters' rights, obviously. The law of adverse possession. And then he moves on to his other tattoos. And I just was cracking up. We wound it. I was like, what the hell did you just say? <laughs> this one represents squatters' rights, obviously. The law of adverse possession. I'm glad you pointed that out because, yeah, I had the same thing. I was like, what, what? what does that tattoo mean? It's definitely not a teardrop. Obviously. Yeah. Is this him? Yeah. Is there in a train yard? So what are your tattoos, man? This one's obviously squatters' rights or the law of adverse possession. <laughs> um, I have a highway for hitchhiking and railroad rails for riding trains. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a lot of train noises in that. That was a pretty good flick. Yeah, yeah, I really liked it, man. Let's I watched get this it three times. Let's get Daniel Skaggs on the phone. That was a harsh stop to that. Ooh, I thought we got rid of those sounds last time. Not the boop, 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 boop. Oh, that's probably for the best. You can't get rid of that Google Voice. I really wish you'd, you'd make it so we can turn that off, Google Voice. Oh, they don't let you turn it yeah, off. Yeah, there's no option to change that or turn it off. Oh, right. man. Hey, Daniel Skaggs. Yeah, this is the the man himself. From uh, Highway Goat Productions. Is that the name? Did I get that right? I did not have that written down. Yes, sir. What's Highway up? Goat Productions. Highway Goat. This is the Chris Briggs Show. You are on the air. Sounds good. How you guys doing? Pretty good, man. I watched your documentary a few uh, weeks ago or months ago. I don't know. Were, were you in Lexington? Yes. Yeah, we had a screening in Lexington at Al's Bar. Uh, okay, I have been there, I believe. Uh, but not for that. So my buddy went there, and then he grabbed a copy of it and then brought it to Indianapolis with him when he was visiting. And we watched it. It's traveling around, sir. It was quite good. 
But well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Why the hell did you make a movie about these people? I found it interesting because I've always heard people say, you know, they ride rails or, you know, they've done this. Like, we were at Skatopia. There were a lot of people who said they'd gotten there by riding the trains, you know, and obviously not paying for them. And they all looked kind of exactly like the people in your movie. They all look like gutter punks, you know? know. Yeah, yeah. They have a very similar look. Yeah. Like, not, they don't look as glamorous as Aladdin does, you know? (laughs) <laughs> no, but they do have those... no. But they have they're, they're very superhero esque in their own way. Yeah, they're interesting people. Are you one of those people? Um, not really. I guess I was. I'm not as extreme as a lot of the subjects in Freeload. Um, basically, I I'd, I'd started hopping trains and traveling around like this uh, quite some time ago, and. I met the most interesting people on the street, you know, people that I had never met before, stories I had never heard, I couldn't even imagine. And over the years, you know, as I travel off and on, I thought, how cool would it be to make a documentary and let these guys and girls, you know, tell their story to the world because most people haven't heard of it, you know, but we've all seen them on the street with dogs and packs. Yeah, they're... They're, they're usually friendly until you hang out with them long enough or you catch them at the wrong moment, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. mm-hmm. And the fists start swinging and the half-gallon bottles go, you know, flying across the room and it's the fuck you, get the fuck out of here. I'd always, yeah, I'd always give them a little bit of money when I'd see them in San Francisco. That seems to be a common destination. Uh, I'd always mm-hmm. give some of them some money or I'd hang out with them and give them cigarettes or, you know, but chatted up with them you know i'm looking for a friend as much as they are you know uh, i wasn't necessarily trying to avoid them but one night i caught one of them at the wrong time and i was not or i don't even know if i had any money but he just he wanted some money and it was he, you could tell that he had that attitude that because i was not in his position i owed it to him and he probably knew where we lived you know because we were on the street you know and he'd probably seen us coming and going a bunch and he basically said you give me some money and everything will be cool. All right. Wow. Yeah, like he was. He <laughs> so did, was it cool or what? <laughs> I probably, I probably said what? <laughs> what? You know, I probably gave him some offended response. I might have, I might have like you know, pulled. Judge Roger robbed you. Yeah, essentially, I might have pulled out like seventy five cents and gave it to him. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's usually always a something you decide to do, not have to do. Yeah. It was it was pretty it wasn't frightening at all. It was I was more I was more offended. I kinda yeah, I kinda wanted to punch him in the face or, you know, or find out where he was the next morning when he was sleeping and pee on him. You know, something like that. Although I've also run yeah, into that's, some that's the best. Yeah, some of them are very nice though. I would say the majority of them are very nice and they're very grateful. You know? But that Yeah, guy, that's one thing, you know, you can't you can't put all these guys in under the same umbrella, you of know. A lot of people do it for different reasons, and you know I've only had the best of luck meeting the the best kids out on the street. You know, from time to time, I've met some some really bad people that don't care about anyone but themselves and don't do anything but harm to others. But fortunately, for the most part, you know I've met some just really good travelers over the years. Yeah, in this documentary you made, it it seems like nobody really has a destination, and they got the whole journey as the re- reward type mentality. Like if you if they were like, there's a scene at the beginning. They start out and they go to New York City, and it didn't. I never heard them say why they were going to New York City. It didn't seem like they had any business being there. The way it was depicted, was that right? Exactly. Yeah. You know, um, we had throughout production we had been traveling all over the united states and we would hit up it was uh coincidentally enough at the same time as occupy wall street was happening so you know we were in like portland and then oakland and san francisco when the occupy wall street movement really caught steam and we just so happened to catch all these different occupies all the way across the country to the east coast and we went up to new york city with with not the intention to for the Wall Street Occupy Wall Street, but it just so kind of happened. Yeah, they but, seem the crew you're riding with seemed like they they didn't like the yeah, Occupy they, guys. They hated them. Yeah, yeah, <coughs> yeah. And that's that's a pretty general consensus by a lot of travelers <laughs> is that hey, you know, we've been out here doing this for years. 
Mm-hmm. This is our life. This is what we do. Now you guys are trying to make a statement, and people are sleeping in parks. And you know, he's like, "Get fucked." We've been out mm-hmm. here doing this our whole lives. Or you know. Well, I think the whole statement with the occupied thing, why they were sleeping out there, is we're not going away until you change something. Like I don't think they were trying to say, "Hey, look at us. We're we can be rugged." I don't, you know, I don't think they wanted to be out there. Whereas you, the people you're riding with, wanted to be out. You know, I think the yeah, I, I think and with the the occupy, act- that's a whole other thing. I mean, I don't think a lot of those people even know what they want. Yeah. yeah, well, they did pay the homeless people to stay out there, feed them, keep them around, give them cigarettes. But that's fuck, fuck occupy. We're not talking. About that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, preach it, brother. Thank you. <laughs> Hell yeah. They're all a bunch of wackos. The ones I've talked to. You know, I'll, <laughs> yeah, I'll, be, right. I'll be honest with you. Um, if she's listening, I apologize, but you know you are. Uh, hold on, what was my next? Oh, yeah. So also in the documentary, you you kind of, you didn't show too many bad things. Like you made it seem like like it was com- fairly safe mm-hmm. and everybody was having a good time. Like were there ever moments where you did not record because people, because I don't know how you could travel that close and you know everybody not have any money and they're like greed come into play or people arguing with each other there's girls around or somebody's flirt with somebody you know what i mean like were there any problems because it didn't really look yeah like- you know there there's definitely a lot of um fight fights and arguments um a lot of tension you know when you're drinking that much and you don't know where you're going to sleep and you're hungry and all those things come into play but a lot of times that doesn't happen until after it's dark Mm. You know, and I didn't have any sort of night vision, and we didn't record a lot of episodes. And also, you know, then you have this whole other aspect of, like, creating unnecessary drama in the documentary when that part is not really telling their story. You know, watching somebody beat the shit out of another person or watching two people fight, you know, over some whiskey and a female, Mm -hmm. that's... that's not really the story we were trying to tell. Well, I would have reload. liked. Yeah, but I would I would have liked to seen that. Not necessarily violence, but you know, at least the aftermath. You know, maybe hear some audio of like a scuffle or somebody yell "fuck you," and then the next morning, you know, you have a camera in somebody's face, and you're like, "So what happened last night?" Yeah, he's like, oh, "I fucking I was drunk and I tried to kiss so and so, and then so and so punched me in the face." You know, <laughs> like just because that's just... yeah. There actually was a scene that didn't make the final cut that. You know, we talked a lot about it, me and uh, Ryan Seitz and Adam McCaller, the editors on this film. You know, we had to go back and forth over a lot of things or a lot of ethical decisions in the end. You know, after we had been working on editing for about a year, there were just times where it's like, ah, well, we could include that, but what's it really going to do for the film in the long run? You know, if it's not, if it wasn't really crucial to the story or to one of the subject stories and it really just didn't make the final cut. Um, was pony boy doing lots of hard drugs? Um, not really. And see, no, that's another thing. When I was around, you know, a lot of these guys, they weren't doing a lot of hard drugs. I mean, you know, we were smoking pot and drinking, but there's not, you know, there wasn't, I didn't see like a needle going into an arm or people passing around a, a meth pipe, or, you know, there wasn't, like, a lot of hard drug use going on in front of my eyes. Okay, that's what I was trying to figure um, out. When you said ethical decisions, you know, you cut things. I thought maybe it was just showing people unflattering lights, you know, like smoking crack and shit like that. No, I mean, you know, it definitely happened. It's, you know, that's just part of the lifestyle. I mean, if somebody offers, you know, somebody else a crack pipe, they're going to fucking hit it because they got nothing else better to do. They're just sitting around wasting time, you know? Yeah, you said at one point you had to uh, wait six hours while they panhandled. I saw that in another interview. Yeah, there was a lot of that. There was a lot of basically just sitting around um, while people were flying a sign panhandling for money. Um, you know, there's always so much you can shoot of that. You can't really tell a story of a person flying a sign for six hours a day to try and make enough money to go buy a half gallon of whiskey or, or some heroin or something. Did you guys ever get stranded? 
Well, the whole movie, they're stranded. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were, man, I was stranded for 18 months. I thought you watched this movie, man. <laughs> well, are you guys phonies? Am I talking about aliens right now? What's I mean, just in, in, you know, like you can't <laughs> get to another city, or we've been in this city for six months, you know, or anything weird like that. You can't be stranded if you got nowhere to be at a certain time. Yeah, you know? that's true. Yeah, right. No, I found we, it. We were never stranded, but we were always stranded. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there was that part where you guys, like, well, I got. I want to know how they treated you since you weren't, I mean, okay, let me get to this first. Uh, when they were, like, there's that scene where you guys are all jumping on the train, which I want to know more detail about how you actually get on a train. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, how one would do that. Not that I plan on doing it, that anybody <laughs> should. And you should also tell people about the dangers. But there's that scene where you you can't jump on the cart you're trying to get on for some reason. So you moved up to, like, the third cart, and you guys, and I, oh, I, and yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I was watching it, and I was like, holy crap, there, because sometimes you guys are real loose on the train, like singing the national anthem, yeah. all drunk, being real loud, yeah. I was like, geez, someone's going to find them, but then there's that one part where you guys are actually walking on the, on, like, the, the railings on the outside, you know, it's kind of like a, you know, you can walk on the outside of the train while it's moving, and I was just blown away by how bold you guys were, and then it immediately cuts to you guys saying, yeah, we just got arrested. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, so that happened in uh, Newton, Kansas, on Easter Sunday, uh, 2012. So, yeah, we got arrested. We were trying to hop out there for like two or three days, and we couldn't catch a train. So we finally, you know, Pony Boy, we just made the decision to get on this train that was leaving, and we hopped on the uh, the third locomotive, you know, from the front, so the third engine back. Oh, man. And... Yeah, and the crew saw us get on, so we pulled out of the yard really slow and then pulled up to this fueling station, and then the train stopped. We all hid in the bathroom, and the cops came in, they threw us down on the ground, they threw Pony Boy down on top of me, and then they took us to jail, and the whole time I'm telling them, I'm saying, you know, I got a bunch of cameras in my backpack, please be careful, don't throw it around. And we get to jail, and they're like, yeah, you know, they didn't believe me at first. And, of course, they're searching all my shit there. And they discover, you know, a camera, another camera, another camera, audio <laughs> equipment, a microphone. <laughs> like, the only thing I had was a sleeping bag and a tarp, you know, and a little bit of food. Everything else in my pack was, like, camera equipment. And that's just how I traveled, you know. But so they think it you're turned some hobos, into... And they find out, they think you're a hobo, and then they find out you've got, like, $10,000 worth of yeah. <laughs> equipment on you. No, it wasn't, it wasn't quite that much, you know, <laughs> never, never that much. But we, you know, because of the tight relationship I made with the guys, they knew, you know, if anybody ever came at me to try and, you know, rob me from my equipment, they had my back, you know. It's kind of one of the things we established early on, which is the whole reason I was able to gain the access that I could to these guys' lives was that they trusted me because I wasn't an outsider, you know. I was part of something that they believed in, a lifestyle that they that they chose to live. Yep. But to get back to that real quick, let me just say, so we ended up watching the trailer for Freeload in jail in Newton, <laughs> Kansas, with all of the deputies and shit hovered around the computer. Oh, wow. And they couldn't believe that they had this, <laughs> you know, big shot director in, in the jail there. They thought I was, like, the biggest thing they'd ever arrested <laughs> in, uh, like, bumfuck Kansas. Wow. What is the, and yeah, right after that scene, I think it was Pony Boy who was saying that, uh, or no, was no, maybe it was, uh, who was, who was the other guy? Hold on. Pony Boy, Scrap, Scrappy. Scra who's the Pony guy? Pony Boy, Blackbird, Scrappy, Blackbird. Christmas. Maybe it was Blackbird who was talking about, uh, about how they, how people say that, uh, they're slowing down the trains. Like what, what are the problems that, I mean, cause obviously it's a liability issue, but like what, does it really slow down the trains? Like, what what do the train companies have? What's the problem? Okay, well, so that was Pony Boy that actually said okay. that in that same scene um, about getting arrested. Basically, you know, anytime they got to stop a train to pull a rider off, oh. that does slow down the uh, the progress of man, oh. so to speak. You know, J John Prine sang all about it in Paradise. I'm sure you guys have heard that song. Uh, um, <laughs> I don't think so, but... Yeah, yeah. Uh, about the progress of man, you know, paradise, John yeah. Prime. Yeah, but so was. Um, well, 
Go ahead. So anyway, you know, if, if they have to pull somebody off, they're slowing down logistics and, you know, global freight that's timed out, you know, especially when it comes to mail trains and all the high-priority, you know, Chinese consumer goods. Okay. Did these guys that you're riding with, because I know you said they trust you, but did they ever kind of look at you different or treat you different? Like, did they, because, I mean, you might have had more money than them. You obviously had that equipment. Like, did they, did they ever try and get things off of you, like your cigarettes or your your booze or your food or your money? No, man. Um, everything was definitely a community. You know, we all looked at each other the same. They They knew what I was doing, and they respected that, you know, as just, something i had to do and there's definitely a communal vibe out there you know everybody's kind of in it the the camaraderie out you know is one of the things that stands out the most to me and always will damn yeah okay so i watched it months ago and then you sent us a, a screener and i watched uh the first half today and so i can't really remember at the end but how what do, what happens to everybody like where are all those people now where are they now yeah, so we, you know, we didn't take the the model documentary of, you know, ending the film with where are they now approach just because it's such a such a gnarly inside view. It's like, well, where, wherever they are now, they're still doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but just to give you guys a recap, so I just actually talked to Blackbird probably like 20 minutes ago. He called him like, ah, I can't talk. These guys might be calling me any minute about this uh, <laughs> radio interview. Wow. And yeah, he was, he just got done. So it's sugar beet harvest season right now. So a lot of these guys, you know, travel up to sugar beet to try and make a couple grand for the winter. Um, Blackbird was just over in sugar beet with his girl. And I think, um, up in North Dakota, I think Pony Boy was up in North Dakota. You know, they're still riding trains, traveling. Pony Boy's still playing music and causing trouble. Um, Christmas, last I heard, is in Chicago. He's um, playing music. He's not on the road anymore. He's kind of settled back down um, to more of a stable life. Uh, Scrappy is still here and there, all over, I think, riding the rails. So most everybody's still doing it. Dice, actually, the guy at the end that had lost uh, seven teeth, mm -hmm. if you remember that scene, the, kind of the way the movie ends there, Yeah. Um, he since got ran over and lost one of his arms and one of his legs yeah that's crazy and had man. to get um yeah he had to get amputated and and get prosthetics but he's still out there traveling and he's you know he's riding the rails with his prosthetic limbs he got like, run over by the train so, yeah he got wow. he was trying to save a puppy underneath the train and it ended up dragging him like 300 feet and ran over one of his arms and his legs that is horrific Holy crap. Yeah, luckily he didn't die. You know, one of the other characters in the movie wasn't so fortunate. He got ran over and was killed. Wow. So, Who was that? you know, that was pretty sad. His name's um, Hotbox. He's, he was a minor character, not someone that you really get to know, but he showed up when Ponyboy and Rachel were off the road. The scene where okay. the dude was throwing the hatchet. Oh, oh, that's the guy? No, that's uh, Sal. So okay. the other dude that only <laughs> um, talks for a minute about the paycheck. Oh yeah. Um, got, yeah, got the little curly Q dreads. Yeah, yeah. Um, wow. That, that's Hotbox or Malcolm Parks. Yeah, he R.I.P. He fucking got ran over down in Georgia by a train, and you know it's sad when that happens. I mean, to go back to what we were just talking about with like the camaraderie amongst people. I mean, it's a community. There's the community amongst train riders is just like a community in your local neighborhoods, you know, and your local school system. It's just like going back to high school. You know, you become friends with these people. You look up to them. You you hang out every single day. You know, all of a sudden that's your that's your adult life, but you just choose to live a kind of a subterranean alternative lifestyle. You know, what what kind of stuff did you decide to leave out of the movie? Um, well, there was a lot, like I was saying, of, like, unnecessary drama between, whether it's between, like, the subjects and their families, or subjects themselves, um, 
just a lot of bullshit. You know, there was that one fight scene that I was saying that just didn't, it just didn't make the cut. I mean, you know, the, the story that we ended up telling was the story that, that really had to be told that we decided on. Um, you know, we did just to plug this shamelessly real quick, you know, we did get distribution. So we're dropping on November 1st, we got a cable video on demand deal. So we're going to be all over cable on demand all over this side of the world. Nice. And, um, Congratulations, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. It's was, it was huge. It's something I just found out uh, a couple weeks ago. I was down in San Francisco for a music festival and got an email and huge news. And then also our physical DVD goes on sale on November 18th. And with that, there's five deleted scenes and then a interview nice. with author Ted Conover and a um, special bonus track of Brian Ramirez, who did our soundtrack. Where's that available? Um, you can contact. We're gonna. We got a new website in the works that we're gonna have up and running. Um, we still have a limited number of vinyl pressed LPs that Brian Ramirez did everything himself. It's super DIY. Uh, I just met up with him and picked up quite a few but he's got them for sale um you can look up killer tree records okay uh yeah killer tree records uh brian ramirez he's he's a awesome musician and the soundtrack i don't know what you guys thought it really kind of like sets the tone sets the pace for the movie that was really that good was, man yeah, that was great you need to get some dale j gordon in there we'll hook oh, you up yeah. with him he would be perfect yeah, music his, for that he's got the stuff. exact same type of style hey are any of those characters or actors in the film or didn't even get like get any royalties out of that man i hope so you know i the, the dream is to um just buy one large ass parcel of land and then Everybody can just come and go as they please. <laughs> well, you're the director. You don't know yeah. if they got royalties or if they will. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, no one is getting royalties because it's a documentary film, oh, is you know, it? other than than the filmmakers themselves. I mean, you know, that also comes down to an ethical thing. When you make a documentary about someone, it's not a Hollywood-style film, you know. We're a super independent-based documentary film company out of Montana, and, um, you know, I haven't seen a single dime. I've spent about $10,000 of my own money on this film over the years. Okay, that makes so, sense. Because if you're paying somebody, I guess that would give them incentive, right, to behave and take kind of the purity out of just filming somebody as they are. Yeah, you can't say, hey, you want to, you know, make 10% of future profits by <laughs> taking part in this documentary about kids riding freight trains? Come on, man. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty cool that they were as like dedicated to the truth. Was there were there any times when they said, "Hey, don't use this"? Yeah, yeah okay. you're always going to have that. Yeah, but then of course it's like, yeah, okay, yeah, we won't use that. Sure, but they, yet they already signed a release. <laughs> and then when <laughs> yeah, they, <laughs> and then when, then when they get drunk yeah. a week later, they say, "Go ahead and use that." <laughs> Yeah, and that kind of, you know, that all comes down to the judgment of the filmmakers and, you know, the guys in the editing room. And, you know, we're not going to, we're never going to put anything in the film that is going to be against someone's own goodwill or good judgment. You know, we're not going to make somebody look like an asshole. Yeah. Daniel, That's how good. long were you on the trains when you were riding them? I was wondering. Uh, just for the filming a freeload uh, yeah i mean like how many hours did it take you to get from a to b um well you know it really depends you know i rode pretty hard there for a year and a half took a few weeks off here and there but probably you know thousands i don't know i mean i mean just, a day, just 24 just one trip you know like how, from elkhart to new york right oh okay so yeah that train was from elkhart indiana to bethlehem or, uh, yeah, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania on that one ride there. Um, probably that was on a mail train, so they run really fast, you know. Then you go like manifest trains carrying boxcars and lumber and oil and high fructose corn syrup and all that shit. <laughs> they move a lot slower. So the high priority trains, I mean, I guess the longest we ever were on a train was probably, you know, a little less than two days. Wow, that's a really but long then, time. <laughs> that is a long time. Yeah. <laughs> How do you the pee? The shortest would have been like six hours, you know, or 
Yeah, where do you guys use the bathroom? Train that only goes in like one. Pardon? Where do you poop? Oh, in a plastic bag, and then just throw it off the side. Uh, Classy. Hey, what uh? I saw one of those guys sleeping on a fucking pile of coal. Like that can't be safe. <laughs> no, it's probably not. I mean, but you know, coal miners been digging this stuff up for for years. You know, black lung, yeah, whatever. Black they lung. lived to at least like fifty something, right? <laughs> That's crazy. John was telling me, what were you saying about Scrappy? Yeah, man. Um, scra- you know, looking around on the internet doing some research, and I, I see a group of people that, that kind of clued me into this one or whatever. But they, the, I went into the movie with the knowledge of that it's Dave Grohl who is Scrappy. You know, that, that Dave Grohl actually, like, he's playing, that's Dave Grohl in the movie. And they're like, you know, they got this conspiracy or whatever. They're like, yeah, that's definitely Dave Grohl. You know, like he's just, that's his alter ego or something like that, riding trains. What what is your official position on that? <laughs> oh my god, this was just brought up in Bend, Oregon, at the Bend Film Festival last weekend. We were there, and the program director told me that you know she thought Scrappy looked like Dave Grohl. That has been an issue since I met Scrappy. People are like, "Oh, it's Dave Grohl." <laughs> um, I do not know Dave Grohl. I've never met Dave Grohl. Um, I can't say anything further but that is not dave Grohl. <laughs> i would like to see an ass by ass comparison i wonder if dave, <laughs> wonder if dave Grohl has tattoos on his ass that's that's scrappy did you get did, did you get to tattoo scrappy's ass i did and it didn't what? make the cut because it was the worst <laughs> fucking tattoo you have ever seen in your life i was so intoxicated <laughs> that it's it's literally like the scribble that says well it's supposed to say skeet because my road name is Skeeter, right. aka Skeet Bang, so I I tattooed Skeet on his ass, and it was you know I'm embarrassed. I'll just say that I'm very embarrassed. Oh, that's hilarious, man! I can't believe you actually got that honor. <laughs> how many? T- how many? Yeah, I'm very like, honored. Yeah, you know, what? I'm up there with his brother and with Blackbird, and just a very limited few to put my name on his ass. Yeah, just in case anybody's unaware, uh, Scrappy lets his his friends or close people sign their name on his ass, tattoo him right on. The- <laughs> he's, he's, got a, he's got a decent collection. Yeah, that ass that he has not wiped in six days. Oh, wow. 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 What did it smell like? <laughs> uh, you know, it smelled like uh, popcorn and, <laughs> and cigarette butts. That's, That's disgusting. Gross. What is that guy's Do you band? you guys have those little buttons you can hit in the studio that make the crazy noises, you know? No. <laughs> we need to. I wish we did. <laughs> <laughs> what is that guy's band called? Uh, what is it Christmas's Christmas. brother or Christmas's band playing oh, the saxophone? The, the Areolas. The, uh... Uh, Puffy Areolas. Puffy Areolas. Puffy Areolas. They're, they're Areolas. Band, um, yeah, the Puffy Areolas. We've all seen them, you know, <laughs> whether it's the band or, or the other. But... <laughs> They're out of Cleveland, really cool dudes. Christmas used to just tour with them every now and then. That's where we first met, was down at South by Southwest. Okay. But he's also played with a few other bands, uh, E.T. Habit, um, this band called Mickey, you know, a lot of bands out of Chicago, but he kills it with the, with Puffy Areolas. I liked how you I liked how you guys edited that where it was basically you know like Christmas hadn't seen Scrappy for a while and you know he's like damn you look old and he you know he basically says hey you need to you need to cut this shit out you need to settle yeah. down get a job you know like get some kids you know you know you could tell he's kind of fucking around but he that's what he's doing and you know he wants his brother to be happy and settle down and stop risking his life and then cut to you know the next scene and now Christmas is you know divorced and he's he's on the road now you know like. <laughs> Riding the trains with his yeah, old brother. Yeah, I mean, it, all that shit took place in like a matter of three months. Everything just kind of snowballed. You know, it went from Christmas touring with the Puffy Areolas to discovering this life he never knew existed. And he just, he was curious. And I think, um, you know, Scrappy and Blackbird went to Chicago and they basically just like kidnapped him <laughs> and took him out on the road and he never looked back. I until believe his feet damn near fell off. What do you mean? Oh yeah, that was oh that was heinous, right? Yeah, yeah I, that's one of the most for... gnarly scenes of the film for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Something wrong with my foot. <laughs> I don't even remember that. Yeah, because I like I said, I only I watched it a couple months ago, but I do remember just 
getting shocked by that that image of his foot. Yeah, it was nasty. It was all red and looked like it was just had sores on it and stuff. Yeah, well, wasn't it black? Yeah. I remember, yeah, I'd have to, maybe I'm making it worse in my head than it really was, but I'm picturing it looking no, black. No, it was disgusting. And, yeah, <laughs> yeah it, was, it was gnarly, man. He got some, like, flesh-eating fucking bacteria and, you know, had to end up going, spending some time in the hospital, and, you know, he's lucky Damn. he didn't have to get his feet amputated. Yeah, I'd say Chris. I'd say Christmas and Scrappy were my two favorite dudes in there. Um, the funniest scene in the whole movie was when uh, Pony Boy, I believe it was, was showing that tattoo on his face, <laughs> and he said, "And you're asking what his tattoo means?" And he says, "Obviously, this is Squatter's Rights Law of Adverse Possession." I, obviously, I had no idea what the hell that was. <laughs> like, well, obviously, this tattoo represents. You know? I still don't understand. I kind of looked it up, but it looks like some legalese or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Basically, you know, it means that if you, you inhabit uh, a place for X amount of days, months, years, you know, the law of adverse possession, it becomes yours. So, you know, if you were to move into a place, it's really big over in over in Britain. Oh. And it's it's one of those things in America where I always hear stories, people talking about squatters rights, and I think it's complete bullshit. Yeah. We, we all know here how the American government works with private property. Yeah, um, throw your no ass one right is just going to like give up their property to some, to some fucking squatter with face tats. And you can't <laughs> and you can't own property without paying taxes on it. You know, so some exactly. squ- some squatter isn't going to show up on somebody's land. Now, I could see how that law could work if uh it is private land and you know like you're you know it seems weird like if somebody somebody's it seems like shared property is more you know like where you could get away with that like if you share a border you know you got a lot of property and then you build a house on your neighbor's property but you know you you don't realize that the property line you're over it and you know if you've been there for 10 years and your neighbor hasn't complained and then on the 11th year he complains i could see where squatters rights and law of adverse possession could come into play because I think it's like that in neighborhoods too. Like if you maintain a certain part of your neighbor's property, eventually it becomes yours. Uh, you know? Yeah, exactly. There's um, a really great documentary called The Garden that is all about. It's uh, set in South Central Los Angeles, and these Hispanic families start this community garden on this vacant um, space, and then like ten years later, the owner decides he wants his land back. And he, you know, takes him to court to get his land back that he hasn't used for 20 years. And then it's a great movie. You, you guys should check that out. Yeah, don't tell me the end. <laughs> Did you ever get hurt? Yeah, while no, no. Did you ever get hurt while you're trying to jump on these trains? Yeah, you know, there's always like a miss. You kind of miss your connection there, and you biff it <laughs> wow. and uh, bust your face or your knees up. Or that's scary. That's man. horrible. Whatever. Most of the time, it's like gravel, right? Or rocks, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty hard, hard uh, rail, railroad gravel. That's some pretty gnarly stuff. Damn. I think I asked you everything I want to ask you, but I know when we get off the phone, I'm going to say, damn it. <laughs> you know, because there were a lot of questions. Yeah, feel that. free. All right, man. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Do you got, like, where? Do, where's what's the website for people to go to? Um. So basically our website right now, I, I just found out today, is down for some reason. Uh, freeloadmovie.net is our website for freeload. You know, we stay in touch with people through Facebook, mainly, uh, freeload. We're on Facebook. That's two words. Uh, right? Highway Go Productions. Yeah. No, no. Freeload's all one word. All right. Um, Highway Go Productions out of Missoula, Montana, or Mon, Mon, just the state of Montana, basically at this point. Um, we have, Twitter and Instagram and all that good shit, and we're working on a new film right now about competitive stone skipping. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, let us know when that comes out. We want to see that for sure. Yeah, that's <laughs> going to be uh, be very interesting. It's been fun. We're in the edit right now. We've we've finished production, and we're we're putting it all together. It's set in the world of uh, professional stone skippers in the eastern part of the United States. I'm looking forward to that, man. Yeah, I really enjoyed this one. So I'm I'm sure. Yeah, you got you got something going there, man. This was a good this was a good film. Yeah, thank you guys. Thanks so much for having me on, and um, I look forward to keeping in touch with you for sure. Yeah, we'll be here for a while. Anytime you need something, just let us know. 
Well, actually, I need to borrow a couple bucks. <laughs> we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that off the air. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thanks again, man. Y'all have a good night. Right, and thanks to everybody for listening. All right. Good night. Daniel Skaggs. I like High- that. That's a good guy. Highway Goat Productions. Uh, Freeloadmovie.net. I do. You know, I. I don't know how often I say it, but I would like to say, you know, I, I like that guy. <laughs> I really like that guy. He's a good guy, man. Oh, I want to thank Darren Snyder at Indian Tune, Frank at the F- Radio Foo Bar. <laughs> Why do I always want to say Frank at 405? Frank at RadioFooBar.com, uh, 405 Media Group. John, you gotta help me out here. Yeah, Ron at RadioMaxMusic.com. He's a good one. He's a real good one. <laughs> uh, we, we do have a PayPal. We are also on. Uh, a, <laughs> I knew before we had started. We're gonna have Patreon. index cards. You yeah. don't need Patreon. Uh, Patreon. Go to ChrisBreakShow.com. Uh, click support the show if you want to help out, uh, or you just like listening. There's stuff on there you can do that doesn't cost you any money. You know, follow us on Twitter at Chris Break Show, Instagram, all that jazz. If it's got a website, we're on it. <laughs> we got the Chris Break Show, John Rapp, sign it out. Bum, 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 bum. <sighs> From the Chris Break Show podcast.